and welcome to the lobby GameSpot's weekly hangout every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Pacific, right here on GameSpot.com. Look at these new cameras. Look at this new set. Yeah. Look at all these people wearing purple. Yeah. Purple Cool Kids Club Day. Oh my yeah. gosh. You didn't get the memo, dude. I did not. Conor McGregor's fighting this weekend, so I went with Tim Schafer's favorite shirt. Uh, he <laughs> sent me a Christmas card last year to Danny on his shirt. Because wow. I wore his shirt Aww. too much. That's a really meaningful so, uh, yeah. card. I'm bringing it back out. Scott yeah. Brotherworks here. Hello. Yep. Alexa Ray Korea is here. Hello. And the internet. I don't even know where to say you're from. You're from the internet now. <laughs> yeah, I live I'm, on the internet. Anthony Carboni, how you doing? I sleep in the wired. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, I'm good, man. Thanks for having me. You're in San Francisco for PlayStation Experience? Came in for PlayStation Experience. Yeah, that was fun. Mm. That was good times. <laughs> yeah, did you spend most of the weekend there? I spent all weekend there, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was doing the live stream. It was me and Meredith Molinari yeah, and yeah. Uh, the PlayStation blog crew, so Sid and Ryan and Justin. Lots of stuff. Kept you busy? Yeah, dude, for sure. You're busy launching your own thing as well. I am, I am. I have a Patreon coming out uh, today, oh. live today. <laughs> Half finished, but live You're today. You're like downstairs finishing it <laughs> I'm off. like, ah! But yeah, uh, you know, I used to work for uh, Discovery Digital and mm. uh, helped create Rev3 Games and D News and like a bunch of those networks. And uh, over the last year, I haven't been doing as much of that stuff. And so now I want to get back to doing weekly videos. So like, you know, those weird videos that I did earlier this year about sort of the intersection of science and games yeah. and like all that stuff. I want to do that stuff regularly. So have it all up on Patreon.com slash Acarboni. And there's... Sweet. Very little there to tell you what's going on just right. yet, but it'll be up soon. If you're watching this on demand, <laughs> it might just be there. Uh, I remember growing up, uh, or the growing up, it's not like it was that long ago. I remember <laughs> being back in Europe, being back in Ireland and, and London watching Bijacker and, and really enjoying it. You oh, thanks, get, man. It's just thinking, it's kind of weird, like that was a show about like this this grassroots new type of video game, yeah, indies. Well, yeah, like 2008, we were just like, there are these indie games, you don't have to buy them in a store, <laughs> yeah. and they're done by small teams, you'll never believe it, they're crazy. Yeah, some of them aren't shit. And now it's you go to something like PSX, or even E3, and it's like yeah. 70 to 80 percent indie titles mm. for a lot of companies, and you're like, yeah, all right, it's cool. Nice. So I would love to, I would love to start covering that stuff again too, you know. Mm. Uh, let's talk about PlayStation Experience. Sure. Uh, it was just uh, on over the weekend. Uh, we were all there uh, the, pay, playing whatever games we could, playing AAA games, playing indie games. Uh, let's go down the couch, Alexa. First of all, what were some of the games that sort of stood out to you at PSX? Uh, Res. Okay. I, uh, I played Res on the VR. Uh, I I don't. I get motion sick, so I don't play VR mm. games. I played it with the Morpheus, and I didn't get sick. And I'm really really happy. So I really like VR. Res. I know you had a very interesting Res experience. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a back room. Yeah. I think you wore this too. I tried to get in. Yeah, okay. And they were like, "It's booked out." Really? You want to wear the trans vibrator suit? You got to <laughs> book ahead. Yeah. Right. So Mizuguchi, being oh, the crazy person that he is built a suit with 26 different vibrators on it, and you went in and played Resin VR with the suit vibrating in time to everything that's happening, and uh, he was secretly taking video of me while <laughs> I was in VR. I couldn't see or hear anything, and it's him just dancing up on me. I saw it. And it's up on my Twitter. It's hilarious. It's just Mizuguchi just like, yeah, you like that res? <laughs> You enjoy it? Was he doing it to everyone, but you're the only one that's got, like, evidence? Uh, I think I'm one of the few people that has evidence of him doing it, but I think he did it for a couple other people, yeah. Uh, I liked how at the end of this pre presentation, he just pulled the mask off, and I go, oh, look, it's it's the Miz, and he's like, waves, and then it just shuts off. Yeah. Yep. It's like, just go I'm gone. <laughs> I'm, I'm going, yeah. Uh, you just saw that, right? <laughs> okay, I'm out. Enjoy. What I love about it, what, what I love about it is it lends itself so well, like you were saying, to VR in terms of motion sickness and everything, mm. because of the aesthetic of it. Mm. You know, when you're in these like hyper realistic worlds, or you play something like a drive club, because they had drive club there as yeah. well, um, that really sets off your inner ear and your sense of balance and your sense of, oh, this isn't real. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, with something like Res or Super Hypercube, because of the aesthetic of it and the feeling of openness, mm. and also I think because it's third person in VR. Yeah, I think that's it. It makes you a it. little less sick. Mm. Uh, yeah. But it's, it's like a, one step removed in a way. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll get into the VR stuff in a little while. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the other sort of big name games that we saw, uh, a game that I pl uh, didn't play for a while, but I got a demonstration of, and so did you as well, uh, Media Molecules Dreams. Dreams. What did you think of it? It's really interesting. I mean, it's the next logical progression of what they were already trying to do with Little Big Planet, Little mm. Big Planet 2, focusing very much on creation, creation tools, empowering players to sort of make their own experiences. Although, um, in talking to the de developers, they told me that there will be sort of a a campaign of sorts, uh, a lot of you know, you know created content, 
um, that exists with you know sort of a beginning and an end, the same way there was in Little Big Planet. I mean, but it's it's kind of there to teach you how to use the tools mm -hmm. rather than. It definitely seems yeah. that way, yeah. And that part was not on display. They were mainly showing off the creation tools, mm -hmm. but they you know were explaining that you know this will exist, but. They're also really adamant that everything in the, the sort of campaign portion of the game will be created with the same tools that they're giving mm. to players. It's not like they're doing something on their end with, you know, they're coding in specific stuff. They're, they're using the exact same tools they're giving everyone else to create their own campaign. So, in theory, you could create something just as robust or detailed or, or rich or even story-driven as what they intend to create it's, for players. Mm. It's funny because that's like that's such a fascinating thing and every time they demo it, they've been doing like these regular dev streams, every time they demo it they create something completely different mm. with it and I think it, it's sort of helping their cause and hurting their cause in a way because it's hard to pin down and explain to somebody within 30 seconds yeah. what Dreams is and why you need it and why you want it. I think it's it's very fascinating to people who are artists or creators. Like they immediately are like, "Oh, I just want to touch this thing and mm. use this thing." But like when you're explaining to somebody who wants to play a game, like, "What do I do with dreams? Yeah. How how do I use it? What am I doing with this thing?" And they're like, "Whatever you want." And it's like, I don't know. It's almost like they made I... a tool and not a game. It, it yeah. kind of feels like that the, they've been in application development for the past couple of years because they they've made this tool set. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was really taken aback by how enjoyable the process of making. Actually, seem to be like yeah. this. Like looking at Bob. Look at how many people watch Bob Ross on Twitch. They're painting. <laughs> yeah. Like I could watch somebody use this who's like good at using it. I yeah. made that same comparison actually to them when I was talking to them, and they were explaining how they wanted to make it accessible and wanted everyone to feel like they were creating something worthwhile and not mm. feel like they were failing to create. And in and, and talking about that, it did make me think of Bob Ross and sort of his approach to painting. Mm. And and they said that yeah, they, absolutely. They, they agreed that that was a good analogy for what they're sort of trying to do. And then they also were were fully open about yeah, this is really about creation. I mean, it's not. A traditional game like we're used to seeing. It's mm. not like oh, I can pick this up and you know play six hours and then I'm done. It's it is more of a creation system. Um, and, and one thing that I thought was really fascinating that they pointed out is you're going to be able to uh, save whatever you create mm. as a, a 3D image file and then print it on a 3D printer. Yeah, or so you can what? make characters what? in the game. This thing is too crazy. 3D print as long them. as you have access to so it. So yeah. you can if you, you want can to, you them can into use dreams as just like a toy creation yeah. system and like. I just want to create a thing I can put on my desk. That's great. It's not a game. It's a toy creation tool. Fine. That's that's how you want to treat it. So they it. use standard wow. because like three D modeling is essentially standardized. You can also like import this stuff into Maya if you want to. Yeah. yeah. Like it's all like it works. Yeah. They, right. they were saying so that a big crazy. part of it is sharing and letting people like if you just want to be a character creator, you can do that, and then mm. other people can take what you create, put it in their own games, or print it for themselves. And so it, it really is about empowering players to create and not so much acting as a traditional video yeah. game. So if you want to think of it as a creation tool system, then I think that's a perfectly valid perspective on what mm. Dreams actually is. Although again, yeah, that is not super mm. easy to communicate yeah. quickly or easily or sexually. Yeah, it's weird. I was uh, I was super cold on it until I saw them doing that stuff and it's it completely is, turned me around. The stuff you can do is super cool. Like the level of, of customiz customization and the, just the things mm. you can do uh, it's it's incredible the, the detail that you can put into things. It looks like they really took that sort of the search me like I remember when you were able to search in Little Big Planet three for like everything, and the search system was so good, and they really applied that to Dreams in an interesting way. When they were doing the on stage demo, they were like, "I'm making a monster, but I don't like drawing eyes. I'm bad at eyes, so yeah. I'm going to look up eyes, and I'm going to see all the eyes. And here's a guy who makes nothing but eyes, and here's a guy who lists himself as a guy who makes nothing but monster parts. Mm. And so you can like mix and match from all these people who already do amazing things." It's interesting because it's going to be it's going to live and die based on this community and mm. what it winds up being whether it winds up being a game or a creation tool or whatever is going to be totally dependent on what the highest number of people is doing with it, right? Yeah. Which is, I think is also interesting. Yeah, because you see Mario Maker go one way where it's like, oh, the first couple of weeks it's all these automatic levels and then it mm -hmm. pulls in this other direction. Um, yeah, it's going to be super interesting. It's been working uh, for Mario Maker though, and, and arguably worked for, for mm. Minecraft as well and in Little Big Planet. So I mean, I think that there is there is space for something like this to succeed. Although you're very right that. It, it, it is very dependent on what the community does with it, and mm. that will dictate how the experience evolves. Stepping yeah. away from that, because we've got a bunch of games to cover. Uh, Uncharted 4 as well, among mm -hmm. things we saw you now. It's a Telltale Dialogue game. Dialogue trees. Well, yeah. yeah. I want to know how that impacts things. Like, I love the idea. I'm all about Dialogue trees. Mm. I love Telltale. I loved, you know, like, the Deus Ex game. It's Mass Effect, all that kind of stuff. But I want to know, like, 
if it has a tangible impact on games, like it's, you know, Does it's it need to get a Okay, so that, this you know? dialogue choice right here is the one that they showed off, and yeah. you're right, it's kind of like... Which well, Uncharted did you like the best? Yeah, how's that going to change <laughs> things? Yeah. yeah. I think they were just kind of showing off, like, hey, this is in there now without yeah, showing off. So I, I need to know more, like, how is this yeah. going to impact the game and the, the, the way that narratives convey like, to players. Like, if it doesn't, that's fine, right? Yeah. Like, if it's just yeah, something yeah. to keep you but engaged in a cutscene. Do I don't know, it's, it feels strange if it's not going to have a, a broader impact. Mm. So it, I, I just, I want to know more. <laughs> it could be one of those things that, where it's subtle, you know, where it's one of those deals where it doesn't look like, because, uh, uh, you know, David Cage's stuff is kind of like that, too, where yeah. you make a choice and it doesn't feel like it's affected anything, but then if you go back and you play again, you're like, oh, that was really subtle mm -hmm. when it changed. Mm -hmm. Telltale does that really well sometimes too. I like that it's Nathan Drake like notary public or importer <laughs> yeah, exporter yeah. or something. Yeah. Worker Drake. Yeah. Just Some... like filling out papers and he's just like grumbling. <laughs> I think that was a great choice, narrative choice on the uh, the writer's part though because I mean we are so used to seeing Nathan doing like these spectacular things or mm -hmm. dangling off a train, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it's, yeah. We're so used to seeing him in precarious positions that putting him in the most mundane setting yeah. possible is just really jarring. He's a family that was very man. clever. That yeah. was very well, clever on their yeah. part to sort and of set the stage for it. It's such did. a good like rubber banding of the conflict that has always been between Nate and Elena too. Yeah. Where it's just kind of like, dude, just like slow your roll for five minutes, mm. and then like, okay, mm -hmm. maybe he finally does for a few years, and let's see what that's done to their marriage. Yeah. And then he's late for dinner because he's talking to his brother on a. It's like family slowed him down. Yeah. Wasn't anything that's oh wait, my wife. Oh, she's mm. at home waiting. I love that. He's like, oh, wait, I'm married. <laughs> like, that's such a, that's such a Nate Drake line, too. He's like, oh, yeah, by the way, I've got this wife. <laughs> she hangs out sometimes and screams at me not to jump into pirate ships. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we also got to see a bunch uh, we also got to see a bunch more of uh, Far Cry Primal as well. Yes. We had seen that a couple of months earlier. Finally playable, and we know what it is. <sighs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Was it playable there? Yeah, yeah, I actually uh, played it on oh, the show did? floor. Yeah, oh, I, I had a bunch of kiosks set up. Um, I, I think it's... Uh, the, the gameplay videos that people have been seeing on, on GameSpot and other sites, that, that's the same portion that was playable on the show right. floor. But yeah, it's just a quick taste of like, it just drops you into the world and says, okay, go kill some stuff, it'll be fun. And uh, I jumped on a woolly mammoth and was riding that around. You can right. charge at stuff. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's, mm. it's you, you are can, the Beastmaster. That's you what can ride is. something, great. and if you won't let you ride it, you can kill it. <laughs> and if you, and if, or somewhere in between, somewhere you in between, have right? Bear go yeah. for you. Yeah, that's so. <laughs> when I was talking to JS about it, you know, he's the, he's the narrative uh, designer of it. I love that they're kind of like stripping away more and more of the things that I feel like sort of got in my way in Far Cry and right. getting to the things that I really love. So like Far Cry 3, you think about like, oh, I want that bear to eat those dudes. But <laughs> in order for that bear to eat those dudes, I've got to like unlock the thing and like throw some whatever yeah, and like, yeah. yeah, and really make it happen. In this one, it's just kind of like, Yo, bear. <laughs> yeah. All I want to see is a bear kill a bunch of dudes. Can the we make this happen? <laughs> yeah. You can be friends with the honey badger now. That awful. There are like 17 different game. animals. I like that you do kind of like a woo, and a giant prehistoric death owl comes yeah. down. <laughs> it's a really insanely large owl. It's like, did, yeah. you, did you use it to like kill anybody? You can upgrade it. Will, yeah. It will destroy people. It's a it brutal swoops. animation. So. And you can upgrade it to throw like poison bombs yeah, you too. Can, like, you know, bomber owl. Because great. why not? It's a real they're, thing. They're really making it just everything I want out of a Far yeah. Cry. He was showing me a part where they go to where he's hunting. You know, he's hunting an animal, and as he's about to shoot it, just like an eagle randomly comes down and takes the animal. <laughs> and he's like, "I guess I don't get that animal." I'm like, "What just happened?" He's like, "Eagle ate it, man." <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, "Hi." Huh? He's this like, is "Life you know, in the priest." Yeah. Yeah. He's like, "This is the way it is," and I'm just, "This is going to be so wow. good." Did it feel like a sort of a blood dragony sized game, or does it? Like it's hard to tell in those types of demos. Yeah, I'm sure, but they're, they're... I think they're looking to make it as big as uh, you know, as big as four was, cool. as big as three was, uh, and you know, other things that they streamlined too. He said no radio towers, nothing like that. You walk. You, you know what's gonna happen? People are gonna be like. I fucking miss them. I miss the radio <laughs> towers. <laughs> I hate, I'm just walking there, around. So it's, you know, it's got elements. I'm just walking around, map. unlocking the map as I go. This yeah. is stupid. Where are the uh, radio towers? Yeah. No, no one's ever gonna say that, Danny. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Really? It'll big Radio me. Tower yeah. fan? Uh, anything else that sort of jumped <laughs> out? Any indie games? Any big stuff? Oh, sure. I mean, like, Firewatch still looks amazing. Oh, yeah. We've seen plenty of Firewatch. Watch. That's got a radio tower. That does, does have a radio tower. It's very it. prominent. It factors very prominently yeah. into the narrative. It does. Game looks good. I like that it's sort of realistic, but not like the the animation style is very cartoony. Like, the yeah. guy you're playing as is like really meaty hands, mm -hmm. meaty cartoon hands. 
Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, it's beautiful. And it yeah. just gets more and more beautiful every time I see it, mm. which is great because it has that same basic cartoony style, but mm -hmm. every time I go back, it's just like a little more layered, a little more beautiful. We still have very little idea what it actually yeah. is. <laughs> That's fine, whatever. I guess we'll know soon. <laughs> it seems like kind of like a couple of steps up from what we've seen of the you know, to be reductive, that walking simulator genre. This mm -hmm. feel, this one feels like you've a little bit more agency, but it's not. It doesn't feel like a big yeah. open world to do lots and lots yeah. of things in. It, like somewhere in the middle, it kind of feels like. Yeah, you have a lot. Of, like there's an instance. I know the one that we've seen over and over and over is the one with the boombox, where you yeah. can either throw the boombox in the lake or like take it and like yell at them or whatnot. But uh, I was talking to Sean Vanneman when I went to play, and it sounds like. Um, it sounds like there will be a lot of choices like that, and wh what you do will sort of influence like how like the area okay, pans like out, or maybe yeah. like how like people react to you, or how like Delilah talks to you. Like, mm. who's she? Yeah. What's yeah, going yeah, on? Yeah. And by the way, if Sean huh? Vanneman sounds familiar, but people aren't totally sure who we're watching, that's mm. the guy who wrote season one of The Walking Dead for Telltale. Oh, so well. yeah, yeah. that's you know it gives me a lot of good faith pedigree. in what this project could, could become. Pedigree. Yeah, they got they got Nels Anderson on on game design. Yeah. He was the guy at Clay who made Mark and the Ninja. So oh, wow. yeah. They got, it's a team Campo that knows Santo their stuff. Knows yeah. what they're doing. Uh, let's talk about the showstopper of the press conference, Paragon. Yeah. Paragon. I oh, Paragon. Oh, okay. No. The, the, it's like, it, it ended the show. It was sort of felt like a whimper. At yeah. the end, it was like, oh, that's it. It's because it's a MOBA. And where are they going to MOBA? Nerds. Okay. An Unreal <laughs> MOBA. Fair enough. Uh, it's, you can go play it now, I think, using yeah. the Unreal uh, Engine launcher or the. Yeah, yeah. Launcher. There's like an alpha. There's alpha access right now. I don't know if that's like limited access or everybody's right. open. I don't know how that's working. Um, it's very interesting to me. It's very interesting to me. It's sort of the same way, like, uh, what is it, Dungeon Defenders. Like, Dungeon Defenders mm -hmm. is basically tower defense. Yes. But because they are switching up the perspective into more of a first-person action perspective, I enjoy Dungeon Defenders more than I enjoy a tower defense game. And I mm -hmm. think that's what they're looking to try to do with MOBAs. Because I think MOBAs are sort of shrouded in this layer of sort of jargon and you know people who are really into them it's a very like insular community yeah. but i think when you watch a moba you're kind of like i get the basic idea of what's going on like i understand the lands i understand that we're both trying to get to like this other side hmm. i get it but there are all these things that kind of complicate and remove i think most people from mobas everything from you know that community that I was talking about to the perspective, like the top-down, click-only perspective. Yep, it feels like one of like a strategy game. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. So I think they're trying to do like, no, this is a really fun type of game. This is an amazing game for teams of people, for for groups of friends. So let's see if we can make that accessible mm. and fun and awesome looking. I'm for kind people. of willing to give it a shot after playing Overwatch and enjoying it so much. Because yeah, that's the game that really broke me out of. Oh, this is straight up a first-person MOBA, and it's probably the best first-person game I've played this year. Man, like I adore Overwatch. So yeah. Hopefully, yeah, we're cracking that nut, and you know, the MOBA, which is quite reductive of maybe expanding it into other things. Um, we're running a bit long on this. Any other shout-outs to games that you guys play that you want to make sure you mention? Shout-outs to video games, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Edith Finch. Enjoy them video games. Love you, doll. Oh, Edith, Edith Finch, Finch, yeah. Actually, very cool. I really like Edith yeah. Finch. Yeah. Yep. Bound uh, looked amazing. Yeah. Battleborn continues to like actually seem like a pretty cool game, even though no oh, one really? seems all that interested in it. All right. uh, Played a little game called Clouds that was really good. Uh, Headlander's really good. Headlander's, Headlander's really amazing. Cool. Uh, and there's a bunch great. of your stuff which we're going to talk about in yeah. just a second, actually. So, oh. ton, ton of cool Think stuff about PSX. For a little I wish we could just like rattle off a ton of you know, ton yeah. more names. But, but if you want more PSX, go to GameSpot.com. We've got all that stuff right there. It's we'll be true. back in a second to talk about virtuality games. Uh, but let us know what you think are some of the games that you as a viewer on the internet uh, were uh, found en entertaining and inspiring at PlayStation Experience this year. We'll be back in just a second. First of all, here's a trailer for a game that came out on Early Access. I feel like Andy Bowman's been playing this for about six months. I think it's officially out now. It's Dirt Rally. Meow.
Virtual reality is coming, whether you like it or not, <coughs> internet. PlayStation virtual reality. Ain't no Morpheus no more. And our panel here, are you going to be taking <laughs> Alexa, the blue pill cross or your the other red leg of virtual reality? Cross your leg the other way. There we oh, go. Right. <laughs> there you go. I'm Please. counter crossing. Now we're killing it. We go, now we're guys. killing it. PlayStation VR. PlayStation VR. We've been talking about VR for feels like eons. Yeah. A couple of years at least, but uh, we're sort of on the it's on the horizon. It's Everyone's really on the hook now. Everyone's kind of yep. thrown down like this is when we're releasing yeah. our thing. So we're getting real close. Yeah. I'm getting so excited. We don't have a price yet, mm -hmm. but I think we're at the stage where people are kind of deciding whether or not they're going to be picking up a virtual reality set, headset. And with PlayStation experience and sort of seeing all the games that they rolled out, uh, I think a lot of people are, you know, PlayStation 4 owners are thinking, "Oh, am I going to be putting money aside for a couple of months and, and picking up mm -hmm. one of these PlayStation VRs. Uh, let's talk about some of the games that we saw uh, shown, uh, first of all, um, at, the, uh, at, at the conference. Uh, Peter, what were some of the ones that jumped out to you? <clears throat> Res was by far the most interesting one. Yes. I hate to beat a dead horse, but mm. as someone who loved the Dreamcast and loved Res in particular, and loves Eve Valkyrie, I see a lot of the things in Eve Valkyrie mimicked in Res Infinite, which mm -hmm. is like using you know, the direction that you're looking to sort of aim the reticle. And that's perfect. It works so well. It ties mm. one to one, and that's the sort of thing you want in virtual reality. You want it to mimic what you're doing in real life. Now, maybe I'm not flying through a simulated computer space thing filled with neon colors, but I can at least feel like I am when I'm aiming in that direction. Yeah, I love that, and I love that they give uh, that they give you the flexibility within it. Because some people were using just the head for the reticle, I yeah. was using the right stick because that's what I'm used to, and mm. they both worked equally well. And what's great is they they work together in tandem in a really interesting way too. So if I'm like trying to lock on, and then I do one of those things like I did in the old res, where I look over in the corner of my eye, and I'm just like, oh no, I forgot to lock onto that guy. Just by looking over to him, I've locked on. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so it makes the whole thing just like. It's much in, quicker, yeah. much easier. Yeah, Eve Valkyrie does that same thing. Mm -hmm. You get to use it to like lock on to ships. So if you're flying forward and a ship goes by, you're like, hold on, I'm gonna lock on. Boop, gotcha. And <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, it's just sort of like you know, that analog mm, to, yeah. what, to what you would mm -hmm. do in, in the real world. And it's brilliant. It, I mean, that that aesthetic, like I keep saying, it's it's such a simple aesthetic, which works wonderfully in VR. Everybody wants to build this crazy realistic city that you can walk around yeah. in. Yeah. And the hardware is just not there yet. No. Uh, early VR is going to be all about good art direction, mm -hmm. and that's something Res has always has. It looks like it hasn't aged a day when you look at it. There's something about that design aesthetic yeah. that Mizuguchi put into it that's just like brilliant and fresh today, the same way it was in 2001. You well, know? it's interesting because uh, you know we're so used to seeing these one-to-one. -one, like one of the biggest problems of VR is like how do you move around? How mm -hmm. do you get people to move around if they can't move around in their space? Do we have it so that they use a controller, or do we have it so that you know you lean forward and you can move around spaces that way? Yeah. Whereas like. Actually, you can make lots of different VR experiences that aren't one-to-one -one matches with you being in a human body. Well, that's yeah. something that Tim Schafer was talking about because you know Psychonauts VR, the Rhombus of Ruin, was one of the big announcements, yeah. uh, and he was talking about how it <laughs> will not be a traditional game where you're where you're moving around. Mm. It's going to use Raz's psychic powers, and like maybe you're jumping from one person's head to another, and that's how you get around. They're mm. going to fall back on their adventure game pedigree and make it very much dialogue-based and story-based. And I think that's going to work so wonderfully. It's, uh, it's interesting as well, Alexa, you were talking earlier about how like you tend to not try a lot of yeah. VR because you get motion sick, but you didn't, weirdly enough, with Res, which yeah. kind of feels like a game that's throwing you around quite a lot. So I've never, I've never tried the Morpheus before. And my last... PlayStation VR. PlayStation VR. <laughs> PlayStation VR. And my last experience was maybe almost two years ago. I played like an Oculus at an event and got... I played E Valkyrie right. and just got violently ill. Like yeah. I get motion sick from first person shooters if I'm not careful. Like, Have you ever I'm seen Cloverfield? Really <laughs> I, that game, that, that, game movie. that movie made me motion yeah. sick. Then you're gonna love Cloverfield <laughs> VR. <laughs> but I played, so I played Res, and I don't know if it's because maybe it wasn't like a, oh, here are my hands, here's my body, and I'm just doing it. But I actually got really brave and did. The, I did the head tracking, and I used mm -hmm. the head. And at one point, there was like a lull in the music, and I looked down, and it's just the tracks going by me, and it's like a little disorienting. Mm -hmm. But I didn't get sick, and I'm very excited now because maybe it's like I don't know if it's like. Res in particular, or the fact that it's third person, or the fact mm -hmm. that the Morpheus is like the more fuck the PlayStation VR <laughs> is comfortable, yeah, and just not and is and I don't feel disoriented. I don't know if it's that or 
but I feel like a whole new world has been opened up to me now because mm. I've been avoiding it for so long. But this works. It's well, strange. With so much of what we've seen, it seems like they're, they're figuring it out. Yeah. yeah. Like over the past two years or longer, we've seen like iterations on this technology and it feels like for usability sake and also like the types of games we're seeing, like it's all sort of clicking into place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What I've noticed, what I've noticed and I've just kind of clicked with me now after hearing Alexis say this is the things that are working the best for me are things where you're either some sort of body or object free floating mm. or you're locked to one space like in Job Simulator where you're sitting yeah. at a desk because you kind of get around that whole like why does it look like I'm walking but I'm not walking? Why does my yeah. body want to vomit more yeah. than anything <laughs> ever in the world right now? I had so much fun with Job Simulator. Like, obviously, you know, the type of experience it probably isn't too much fun to play over and over and over again, but like, just the, you know, I wonder will this work? And then it works like I picked up the plant mm -hmm. and, and put it in the coffee machine. Oh. And it, like, I found this disc and I put it into the computer and it ended up being like a Flappy Bird clone got loaded on. Wow. Uh, like, kind of like Surgeon Simulator. I just, love your, I just love your idiot baby hands just like mashing on the keyboard there. It was super but I fun. Oh, it's Mary doing it. Oh, it's Mary's idiot baby hands. <laughs> Uh, I, I, but then on the other Looking side, good, of Mary, weird, is what I meant to say. I, I played drive. <laughs> there you go. There I'm back. There's the idiot baby I was talking about. <laughs> uh, and on the other side of that room, I played Drive Club, and uh, I, I played it. And I've, I've done other racing games in VR, and actually, that kind of felt like it didn't really work. That kind mm -hmm. of felt like it was. Well, you don't need. Well, here's the thing. Everybody thinks that racing is going to be like the perfect natural fit, and it mm. sort of is. But it's also the thing that needs VR the least. Right, because you're, like, you're sort of always looking forward, keeping your yeah. eye on the track mm. and what's going on. And so it was very rare that I actually used any head tracking in yeah. that club. Like in most racing disciplines, you're like, even your wind mirrors are like within, you know, eye flicking you know, yeah. radius of where you're supposed to be. I think the impressive thing about the Drive Club demo was they were showing off how far the PlayStation VR headset has come since that initial prototype. Right. The same mm. way they're showing off uh, the w how far the Oculus has come and things like that. As they're, you know, raising these frame rates and these refresh rates and everything is getting brighter and the head tracking is getting more one-to-one, -one, they're just trying to show off like, hey, we can do an experience like this now and it will not make Alexa Ray Korea vomit <laughs> yeah. much. It's comfortable too, <laughs> isn't it? Like that unit, but Peter, you, you, I feel like, of all the people at GameSpot, you have used VR the most. Um, you're the most experienced with using all the different iterations of these. How do you think that PlayStation VR headset feels? Because to me, it's like it's so light. It feels super easy to like move on your head and everything. Yeah, I mean, as these things develop, you know, obviously the materials get refined. They they realize they don't need as much circuit board. They can mm. they can find lighter materials that wick away moisture and stuff, and these things become more comfortable. And I think. Some people will always find something to complain about, but really, yeah, like the Morpheus is really comfortable. Mm. Uh, the latest Oculus yeah. is really comfortable. Even the latest Gear VR. I mean, the, people are iterating on these pretty quickly and coming up with solutions. <laughs> Look at this guy's that wrist. poor <laughs> demo. Those poor guys. Yeah, that's the bam. There it is. Of, uh, that was not. Uh, this is the that easiest. did not go well for them. No. And uh, you know, <laughs> if, you, if you look at how fast it's progressed already over the past three years, project ten years down the road, right? Right. I mean, these things will continue to shrink, continue to be more comfortable. We are at like the the frontier of VR even now, still after years of doing this stuff. It hasn't hit market really. Like mm. it's it's not really gone mainstream and gotten the money to keep making more things and keep refining it. So it's just going to get smaller and more comfortable. So even if it's not perfect right now, don't discount it. Like. Mm. The, the, some of the early experiences are great and they totally make up for a little bit of discomfort because you get an experience unlike anything that you've played on a traditional mm. you know, TV with a, with a controller. So I think that's a great point. Sorry. I think if it can make it through these first three or four years, if these companies can really like stick it out, keep supporting it, don't pull money out of it the, same, the way they pulled money out of like a Kinect or a Move or mm. something like that, as long as they don't get bored and see the profits kind of not coming in for the first three or four years, I think this is something that could really catch on. But it's something where they're going to have to commit to backing mm. it. Well, the, the, the thing is that most people now, at least in our groups, right, we talk mm -hmm. about this as a game first device. Mm -hmm. But VR is being utilized, and I, I guess I've said this a lot of times now because I feel like I'm repeating myself, but it's used for therapy yep. a lot. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. burn victims heal faster walking through snow in VR. You know, huh. PTSD people are able to overcome these memories that haunt them by reliving them in a different context. Mm. So those are the sort of things, and even like airlines, like putting VR in the seats, those are the sort of things that are gonna support the VR industry. Yeah. Games will then benefit as a result. Yeah. So I would be shocked if it didn't continue down the road it's already going. I mean, to see somebody like Samsung jump in bed with, with Oculus, mm. I mean, 
you know, and then Facebook owning Oculus, like those are two big powerhouses. They are not going to just get their toes wet and then sure. say, well, it's cold. <laughs> They're going to jump in, you know, full force and, and we'll continue to do so. Well, I think that's time. interesting because then that brings up like Sony. I mean, Sony obviously is thinking about this in terms of, of movies, entertainment, mm. and games, but they're sort of, they're not on the forefront of like those same sort of things that you're talking about with these research companies where it's like, right. well, they don't really put money into things like therapies and, and that sort of stuff. So mm. they're maybe the company that has the most to lose, but also I think has the best chance of getting a toehold in the consumer market mm. because I'm not going to have to have a high-end PC. To do the it, box yeah. is already in my living room. These games already run to spec without mm. me having to fiddle with anything the way you have to with an Oculus or, or, or anything right now. So they have the they have a big chance to kind of take the living room, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. I think is interesting. Yeah. And you can really see from the, like all their PSX presentations that they really want the living room. Mm. They want it so bad right now. I'm curious to see... Thirsty for that living room. <laughs> curious to see what Valve does now that they've started their whole Steam Machine initiative. Mm -hmm. Although it's not taken off very well, you know, how far are they from having a box that they sanction as being, this is the, you know, the Valve VR box, yeah. right? And that'll sort of get rid of all the, the high-end PC stuff because really developers just have to aim for a certain spec, like they're doing, you know, as you described with PlayStation 4. So I, I could see, you know, HTC cornering the PC market with Valve's help down the road. I mean, that could be yeah. something that works out really well for them like, and for gamers in general. I love that we're talking about all this, all these lofty mm -hmm. technology goals and everything like that, and all I want to do is play 100-foot robot golf with yeah. the thing. So, oh like, like a lot of what we talk about when we talk about this is we, we start projecting, like, you know, five or ten years in the future, and it feels like there's so much... Uh, like not optimism, but people are, are fighting for VR in a way that they didn't with Connect and Move. Like people, yeah. or even it seems 3D. like yeah. more people. Yeah, more more people are sort of they want it to work. So like sort of real talk. 2016, PlayStation VR comes out. I know we're maybe though it's skewed a little bit because we're people who do this professionally, but like. How, uh, who's going to buy one? Like Alexa, are you, are you going to get one yourself? I, it didn't make me barf, so <laughs> probably. <laughs> I'd like to. That's actually the top of her scale. <laughs> yeah. Her scale goes. Her scale goes barf. from fainting and vomiting to didn't make me barf. It didn't make me barf. And I'm, I'm excited about that because everyone's talking about VR. Yeah. You all, you guys all come back from shows and it's like, oh, I played this, I played that, and I'm like, oh, I would have barfed, so I didn't play it. So, so that's that. Like you didn't want to yeah. be left out of that conversation. Right. So I wonder if there's going to be enough people who buy this who then. You know that early adopter thing where yeah. they like push yeah. everyone else into also. I'm gonna have up. three headsets in my house by the end of next. Do you year. really think you? Are? I really am wow. going to have three headsets mm. in my house. I am an idiot. <laughs> I will do it. I love it that much. Well, you don't know which one Pornhub's gonna go with, right? You and until it. I know, oh, <laughs> until because I want to play robot golf, <laughs> but I also want to get up on that. Pornhead. Pornhead. Robot yesterday, something else. Yesterday, <laughs> Razer because they have their own open source VR headset. Okay. The CEO of Razer tweeted out, and I'm not saying. We're supporting porn out of the box, <laughs> but I am saying there is a native app for the only VR porn producer out there. Wow! On our device, out of the Four box. Four headsets, Danny. <laughs> out of the Four box. Four I'm going to have I now. Got it. I got it. <laughs> uh, Peter, I'm, I'm assuming you'll probably jump in on a, on a bunch of them. Yeah, I mean, I'm. Yes, I, I think I. Even though I am like really passionate about it, I will probably go for the easiest solution first. Hmm. Um, Samsung Gear VR is great, but I don't really like Samsung phones. Right. So for me, it will probably be PlayStation VR. Um, I have a PS4. Uh, and I like some of the demos that they've put out. Um, I will have a rift in time, but in time is the key word. So do we think that PlayStation 4 owners are going to pick this up? Because by the time this comes out, we will be two and a half, in coming up to three years after a console has come out, maybe that takes the sting out of having to spend whatever it is yeah, they ask. Exactly, because people yeah. are ready for the next best thing. And if it's not going to come for another seven years, right? right? Yeah. Like, why wouldn't they? It's all going to be about price point, though. Yeah. I think it's yeah. all going to be about price point. They can't release it for less than like 300, right? It's oh, no, they could. They could easily subsidize it. Oh, right. Yeah. You think? Yeah. I think so. But would they? That's yes. the big question. You think so? I think they will. To I get people to into that ecosystem? The only way this is really going to, to, to catch fire is if people are at their friend's house and using it, right? So if Sony can't get this into people's hands, right. it's not, they're not going to be able to market it so well with a commercial. It's going to be experiencing it. Because I've talked to people about VR a thousand times, and it's not until like you tried that demo at GameStop yeah, yeah, yeah. that you were like, oh, wow. Okay. And me and Andy Bauman went into that room, the, the the sort of VR room that they had for the price. And he's kind of like, he gets hot and cold on this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And when he put the headset on, he came over and went, you know what, like, we watch videos of people, like, 
playing VR all the time, like this stuff. He's mm -hmm. like, we're yeah. just gonna shoot more B-roll of this stuff, and it doesn't really put it across. He was yeah. like, I put the headset on, I was like, oh yeah, sorry, I remember, yeah. this is fucking amazing. But yeah. you know, the big, the big thing that really made me go all in uh, at PSX was, we're finally seeing games. We've yeah. been seeing a lot of demos of like, pick up a thing and you're in a forest and look around and it's like, no, this is a game. And a lot of them. Yeah. Like it feels like there's, now I'm at the stage where I can't name all the VR games that are coming out on, on PlayStation's uh, platform. And that's important because I think people were seeing it as this long-term tech demo and now it's kind mm -hmm. of like, oh, Yes, 100 games. foot robot golf. Did, I get it. Did you know you could pick up stuff and put it in the photocopier and it made duplicates? I had like 15 <laughs> donuts by the end of this game. Whoa, wait a minute. Wait yeah. a minute. Yeah. Donuts really yeah, need look, to work there, like that, look, though. Look at the thing. Oh, there it is. Oh. Fucking T Earl Grey. It's a bad time to have diabetes. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Amazing. Uh, virtual reality. There you go. Uh, four to four thumbs up, or you know, maybe eight. We can go. Uh, here on the couch, uh, let us know what you think of VR. Uh, do you want a PlayStation 4? Are you going to pick up a uh, PlayStation VR yourself? And what's the right price point? Let us know in the comments below. We're almost done today, folks. You know what was announced? Uh, what was also announced at PlayStation Experience? I think you're going to say something that wasn't announced, but was was talked about. Some yeah. more. Yes. It's got all the girls. Was Wait, that the, was that the I quote? I really don't know what you're talking oh, about. Oh, what? I don't know is what this, this is Are about. you going back to the Pornhub thing? No. Are you playing okay. I wish. <laughs> you got that Pornhub trailer ready, Mary? Uh, Cue it up. Oh, Yaku Yakuza 5. Oh, yeah, Yakuza 5. Remember? Yeah. Well, that was announced a long time ago. All the girls are beautiful. I think that's what it said. Which was a bit weird. About the announcement of Yakuza 0, which was yes. not previously announced. All right. Well, we don't have the trailer for that we're showing. We're showing the trailer for Yakuza 5. Already. So watch But imagine it's Yakuza 0. Yeah. It's minus 5. Ha, <laughs>just as a remaster but as a remake and uh, over the weekend of PlayStation Experience we saw some more of that remake uh, Alex Ray Korea, Anthony Carboni, Peter Brown who's excited for Final Fantasy? I'm going to defer to the Final Fantasy scholar here Yeah, you guys. <laughs> and let her There's another one we got, we got two fi Are you a Final Fantasy scholar as well? I would say so I, I, don't, disagree, but <laughs> I don't know you the way I know Alexa okay. <laughs> uh, Trailer look cool We saw a bunch of Midgar and for a reason, That's it like seems. That's like the first 20 minutes of the game. Mm. And the first downloadable chapter of Final Fantasy yeah. VII. Yeah! What's up, oh, episodic yes. content? So subsequently, uh, I guess Square put out a press release, I think it was on Sunday, saying yeah. that... Uh, the, multi -part. The, yeah, the story will be told across a multi-part series with each uh, entry providing its own unique experience. As Final Fantasy fans, does that ring alarm bells or does that sound fine? I, uh, so I go both ways. I am, so I am not as Anthony is not the biggest fan of Final Fantasy VII. Okay. It's a fine game. It's not the best one. No. But. No. I, and, and considering, <laughs> considering they've put out the game and then they made this, yes. the prequel, the sequel, the CGI movie, yes. the spin-off yeah. couple games, that, that world has been beaten into the ground and they've done, and they've just sort of, it's all sort of dried up to me. But the fact that we're going to get Final Fantasy VII in a different way, in mm. a different format, mm -hmm piques my interest. Yes, cool, I'd like to see you, if you can make this a fresh experience, yeah, I'll play it. Also, I'm a Final Fantasy nerd, so I will. However, 
My worry with the episodic thing is, is it going to be something like what Telltale does, in which each episode or part is self-contained? Because what happens if, say, the first episode is all Midgar and the second episode is pulling a random whatever, right. Cosmo Canyon or something? If you want to go back and complete the quests that you didn't or do things that you didn't in Midgar in episode one, can you go back to previous content? Is mm. it going to pile on top of each other or will they be self-contained experiences? Because part of what makes Final Fantasy so appealing is that you have these vast worlds that you can go back and do whenever, mm. do whatever side quest when you want. It. And a lot of people, I know we were talking about this earlier, mm -hmm. after you do the story, you spend the next 20 hours grinding and cleaning up everything else that you didn't do in the game. Yeah. Can we do that here? Uh, we don't know. I've not, I've played maybe, the, I think, the first like three or four hours of Final Fantasy VII, uh, only recently as well, this year. So I'm not a scholar when it comes to this. Mm -hmm. Peter, is it the type of game as well that you can sort of, you can drift forward into areas that you maybe shouldn't early? Or does the story very much sort of like unlock stuff? It's pretty like linear. Places. There's a lot of side content that people love, even optional stuff like getting Vincent or Yuffie, for example. But chocobo breeding. Chocobo breeding. I mean, those are oh yeah. Things. Get that gold chocobo. Golden Choc saucer. Oh, wait, wait your turn. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, you know, I, I think the fact that this is happening at all is kind of a boon for people who, who appreciate this game. Mm. And while I would love to have a faithfully recreated, like massive new version of Final Fantasy VII, I'm not kidding myself. There's no way Square Enix is going to do that faithfully mm. and 100%. But yeah. if I can get really well-composed vignettes that take me back to the game that I really love and show it, showcase it in a new way and let me interact in that world, I'll be really happy. Now, the fact that they're charging a full price per episode... Well, we don't know that yet. Okay, well, the fact that it sounds mm. like they might be doing that anyway, it is, you know, that's concerning. If it's something like a Telltale game, Wow, like, who can complain at that point? But when you say vignette, that sort of, that, uh, you know, raises alarm, rings alarm bells in my I can't because... tell the difference looking at the two of them <laughs> side by side. Because <laughs> that's like, that could mean that it's not the entire game then. That could yeah. mean that this is just like a, you know, three hour segment. Oh, you remember this cool part of okay. Final Fantasy VII? See, here's the thing, mm -hmm. most people never talk about Final Fantasy VII and how it relates to today, right? Mm. So many games in the series are so far like out of the realm of possibilities and I'm not saying Materia is a thing or that chocobos are real mm. what? But, but what? I know I know as much as we but he's also them, not they... saying chocobos aren't real right okay. no 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 for all you we're kids not, out there we're not drawing a conclusion <laughs> on chocobos no, it's my but, favorite Pokemon but, but this, <laughs> this this game really at its heart is about you know corporations running amok it is about exploiting the environment mm. it is about rebels taking on forces that are insurmountable to the common man and doing so in a way that's destructive, but also revolutionary. And I think that those themes are really powerful. And you don't need this stuff like Chocobo Racing to do that. And frankly... Okay. But that is one of the, <laughs> Look, that is one of the high crazy. points Look, of the thing, though. I love Final Fantasy VII. Yeah. It is my favorite game alongside Tactics. But at the same time, we still have the original. And we sure. can even play it on PlayStation mm -hmm. 4 right now. So if people love it as much as they say they do, put your money where your mouth is and play it. Mm. You know. But if, if, if we're honest with ourselves, we cannot expect Square to take a game that featured pre-rendered backgrounds and create a fully fleshed out 3D world around it, one to one, that's for right. the price so, of one game. No, that's totally that they're it. They're not doing that. Yeah, they said they're going to try to keep uh, as much of the content in as possible. They're going to cut some stuff, but they said they're also going to be adding some stuff. So I get this feeling that they want these episodes to be longer than just a few hours. I'm yeah. thinking they're thinking, you know, maybe these are 20 hours a piece. Maybe mm -hmm. these are things that are worth worth buying because it's the length of an average game. Mm. And I have to say as somebody, as, as a person sitting on the couch who's not a fan of Final Fantasy VII, mm. who like, I get it, it is the game that built the PlayStation, I understand why it has such a huge place in so many people's hearts, I never liked the game. Yeah. But watching this, the way they're doing it, the way mm. they're doing it with the, with the Kingdom Hearts slash Final Fantasy XV combat, mm. the way they're kind of like making it new and making it a, a, a more accessible game, in a way that doesn't seem to be taking away from the aesthetic and the things that the mm. fans love, I may like this version of Final Fantasy VII. <laughs> this may wind up being a net positive, right? Because everybody who loves Final Fantasy VII gets what they want, mm. and I get a Final Fantasy VII, and you get a Final Fantasy VII, that maybe you make it past the first few hours. Right, yeah. You know? Maybe we all wind up liking it a lot more, and it kind of takes this dried up world that you're talking about and makes it Super new dry. again. Yeah. Like, Super dry. Oh. It's almost Super the most, dry. It's like, the, it's like the most thankless <laughs> job in development trying to make this game because some people mm -hmm. are going to want it to evolve, some people are going to want it to be as true to form right. as possible. 
possible. Some people would be happy with the new gra graphics. Some people want just an up resed version, the purest remastering you could possibly yeah. think of. Uh, do you think that, uh, like, you guys have expressed sort of a bit more, uh, you guys are okay with this changing it up a bit, you know, in terms of gameplay, in terms of how it's released, all that sort of stuff. Do you think the general Final Fantasy fan, 20 years later, is going to be as accepting of those changes? Uh, yes and no. I know there are a lot of people that are Ooh. or will be angry that this is that it's it's episodic. It's not they're not getting Final Fantasy VII remade a game. They're mm. getting something in pieces. And I I have I have been on the internet and I have seen the sad. Mm -hmm. um, Don't go on the internet. Don't I know, right? That is Don't literally that. where all the sad is. But Don't do that. I mean, and there and there are people out there that also like are like they love Final Fantasy but won't play Seven, the original, right. because they think it looks bad and they don't mm. want to waste their time with it. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that the people that love the game for what it is will play this and be like, I'm getting something I love, like Peter said, again in a new way, and mm. yeah, but I also can definitely see people being outraged about it. Personally, as someone who's like big fan of the series, again, not a fan of Seven, um, I, I, I really like it. I like, give you, give me Final Fantasy anything, that freaking, uh, like the chibi Final Fantasy game, World of Final Fantasy is coming out next year, and it looks like, it looks like a kid's game. I'm going to play it because it's Final Fantasy, and I'm a nerd, <laughs> and it has a name on it, so yeah. I have to get it. Um, but no, I can see this both uh, earning a lot of yeah. love, but also kind of losing a lot. Yeah. Well, you guys have had your say. Now it's up to the internet. <laughs> uh, let us know what you think. Final Fantasy VII Remaster. Remake? Remake. Remake. Not remastered. Remade. Remake. Remade. Remake. 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 You got it. Remake. One of those <laughs> is right. Final Fantasy VI Remake. <laughs> oh, don't tease me. Nah, Don't nah. tease me. Let us know what you think. Are you excited? Are you disappointed? <laughs> Put your thoughts in the comment box below. All right, we're almost done with the show, but first we got to give away some stuff. I told you my favorite Pokemon. Chocobo, right? Chocobo. <laughs> uh, but what's your favorite Pokemon, Alexa Ray Korea? Uh, Squirtle. Okay. <laughs> Ashley Carbody. I'm a big Eevee fan. Eevee? Yeah. Eevee, huh? I'm a big Wasn't Eevee fan. I, it's a little. Is I that have Wally. I have a. I have a Pomeranian at home. That looks okay. kind of. That looks kind of like an Eevee. That's kind of why I got a Pomeranian. Okay. I like Aww. Eevee and I like Flareon. That's great. I got a pair of keys back home that look like a clef key. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. What's and that? A bag of trash that looks like a trubbish. Trubbish. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Peter, what's your favorite? Pikachu. What's not to love? Oh, Pikachu! Come on. Do we Pikachu's Pikachu overrated. It's probably some sort of Pikachu. Wow. Is the Squirtle fan. Uh, <laughs> the, I just named a Pokemon. Get these down here. Uh, our good friends at PokemonCenter.com sent us uh, two of these. We have two. This is, is one this set, thing? and we're giving away two of them. It's got a bunch of trading cards. It's got this. This is a Nendoroid, y'all. This is the real deal. Guys, Nendoroids. What's a Man, Nendoroids are illegal in some states. Um, you can win one of these packs. Here's another trading card game. It's really heavy. It's All right. Put, it's put in your pocket. Okay, miss uh, up my microphone. There's another one right there. <laughs> uh, you can win by Stoneheart. On this game is third. also a uh, Game of Thrones spoilers. Hit that retweet. Yeah. Hit that retweet. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty good. Hopefully, no one heard that. Follow GameSpot. You Follow GameSpot for a chance to win. Retweet. Courtesy of PokemonCenter.com. <laughs> Thank you. And Finally, the, the Pokemon and Game of Thrones crossover that everyone was asking for. <laughs> a Telltale game series. A Telltale game yes. series. <laughs> Would you play a Telltale Pokemon game? Yes. Yeah? I'll play a Telltale anything. Like a Batman coming out? I'll play that Batman. Oh, God, we didn't talk about any of that shit. No. I know. About, what else did they do? They're doing a couple more. They're doing Walking Batman, Dead Season 3. Walking Dead Season 3. Mm. A unannounced, mar unannounced Marvel game. Okay. That they announced but have not named yet. Right. Um, and uh, the Michonne thing and Game of Thrones Season 2. The Michonne thing. Oh, is that what the Walking Dead Season 3 one is? No, no she's, she's getting her own game. One. She's getting her own one. Yeah, yeah. she's got her own game. Michonne. 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 I like it. There you yeah. go. Say Michonne, Peter. Michonne. There you go. <laughs> four Nendo four. Roids are legit, I'll say it again. Want me to. Achievement unlocked. Who is this person? I don't know who it is. Isn't he from Pokemon X and Y? Could be. It's N. It's N. Man. Collect them all. It's N. One to change N's expression. <laughs> but I have the I have the Nendoroid, the Wind Waker Link. Okay. Yeah. And the Metal Gear 5 Ooh, snake. With the, oh. oh, you have the Metal Gear 5 snake? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Damn, I've got the original. He looks like a baby. Yeah. How much and did it cost? Not that much, like yeah. 70, 80 bucks. Yeah, you can get it when if you, you import them. If you find them on <laughs> if you find them on Amazon, like by somebody who's who's like importing tons of them. Like I got yeah. my link for fifty. 
Okay. Just go yeah. to Japan and buy it there. They're starting to release them in America now. <laughs> go to Japan. For a while. They Jap were. Japan. 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 Oh, that, is that how it's said? Japan. Yeah. <laughs> I've only seen it written. Japan. <laughs> yeah, if it was in England, they'd call it Japan. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony Carboni, thank you for coming yes. out today and showing us the Pokemon cards. Uh, one more time, your Patreon. Patreon. It's Patreon. It's um, and we have it in, in Japanton. It's uh, Patreon. <laughs> it's patreoncom slash acarboni. The page is half finished. It will be totally finished tonight, but it's open and going and doing things. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Thanks to the folks at CNF for allowing us to use their beautiful studio. Look at all this sick ass construction that's going on outside. <laughs> that view is just. Apparently, you can see the bay at one stage. There were so moments. Their new set, right? Yeah. The, yeah. Okay. That's the trans base set they're called. There were moments during this when I was pretty sure just because of the way the lens works on your single that that crane was just going to roll right through your head, Danny. No. Just right you through your skull. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. Uh, and thanks to everyone in production. Mary Kish, Josh Shaw. Uh, we got some CNF folks in the back helping out as well. Thank you. I don't know your names, but you're rad. Especially that Mike guy. <laughs> Super dope. Uh, we'll be back next week. We got one more episode of The Lobby uh, from up here this year. Uh, we're taking a little bit of a break in January, but we'll be back. Uh, with that and all of our Game of the Year stuff, which is currently ramped up on the site. So make sure you go to GameSpot.com and check that out. We will see you next week, Tuesday, 2 p.m. Pacific, right here on GameSpot.com. Goodbye.